Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started today, or tonight, and uh, today is the topic of mutations. Now, evolutionists have, have long, you know, said that mutations are the mechanism for change in the story of evolution, changing molecules into man. So, in this presentation, we're going to actually look at what the evidence is and whether mutations are really the evolution solution that they're supposed to be from an evolutionary standpoint. So we'll get some, some basic terms down here. First, you're probably all familiar with DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, it's a double helix spiral. Uh, looks like a, a ladder that's twisted. And the, the, uh, the size of the ladder are made out of sugars and phosphates. And then the uh, base pairs here are called nucleotides. They're like the rungs on a ladder. And you can see they pair up uh, adenine and thymine, cis or cytosine and guanine. And they all match up and pair up just like that. Now, humans have approximately 23 billion base pairs of nucleotides. These are, each one of these is a nucleotide, and each one of these is a pair. We have 3.2 billion of those. And the nucleotides combine into chemicals known as amino acids, and then those amino, or, or amino acids then turn into proteins. Now these are very small, the DNA molecules are very small. Uh, you call this the, the full molecule, but each one of these is a strand that uh, when it divides, it divides right down the middle. So each one of those is a strand of DNA. The diameter of a, of a DNA molecule is two nanometers. I know you don't know what that means, but it's two billionths of a meter. Uh, to look at that number, it's a two preceded by eight zeros. Very small. Uh, just to give you a little idea, one single human hair ranges anywhere from 80,000 nanometers to 100,000 nanometers. So if you took a, a cluster of DNA, you would have to have between 40,000 and 50,000 strands of DNA to be the thickness of one of your hairs. Very small. However, if you, if you unwind the strand of DNA and you take both of the strands and you line them up, one at the end of the other. It's six foot long. Uh, this is actually this is what the DNA molecule looks like, and, and what you'll see is this double helix strand, and then it's wrapped around basic proteins called histones, kind of like you would take thread and wind it around a, a spool, and it gives it structure and it protects it from damage, and then from there it's wrapped into coils and they begin in super coils, and so it's, it's very compact. The DNA stores piles of information that range anywhere from, you know, how, how a petal shape is coded to what color of eyes you have. And, and it is phenomenally packaged like this and very compact. And each person, each human, has 23 pairs of chromosomes. And in each one of those chromosomes is one DNA molecule that's wrapped very efficiently. And in each one of these DNA molecules, like we said, there are two strands. If you would stretch out, as I was saying, if you'd stretch out all of the cell, all the DNA in all of your cells, it would be 67 billion miles long. That's a long way about 150,000 trips, round trips to the moon. That's a lot of information. Now, DNA contains information, as we said, and it's similar if you compare the, the information and the, the communication of DNA to other communication methods, like Morse code, for example. You can think of it as letters strung onto a piece of string. That's what DNA essentially is. It's, it's an alphabet, a chemical alphabet that's in your genetic code. Now, there are no natural laws that anybody knows of 
that produces information by, by just interactions with matter. There is no known method of getting information from nothing. And the information cannot be explained by evolution. And so God designed this language and, and so it could produce all the proteins that every living thing needs. Now, if we took three of the symbols of Morse code, the dot, dash, and space, and say that that represents three of the four nucleotides in our DNA, you could get 26 letters, which is what we have in our alphabet, and if you arrange those 26 letters, you can get up to 400,000 words. Now, if you take those same nucleotides, those same four nucleotides, you can get 20 amino acids, and over 100,000 proteins. If you look at the amount of DNA that you can put on the head of a pin, there's enough information to fill a stack of books reaching from the Earth to the Moon 500 times. Incredible amount of information stored in DNA. If you take a square inch of DNA, you could put the, the contents of seven billion, with a B, Bibles, one square inch of DNA. Now, the DNA gets copied during cell replication. What happens is it unzips itself into the two separate strands, it makes a copy, and then it recombines. And it copies very, very accurately. There's a built-in spell checker and a proofreader in our DNA that copies it exactly. So most of the time, there are no mistakes in the DNA, but every now and then, there is a mistake that creeps in. It's very rare. Only about one mistake slips through every 10 billion nucleotides that are copied. So very rare, but it does happen. And when a mistake occurs, we call that a mutation, obviously as defined as any change in the sequence or structure of DNA. Now there are gene mutations and there are chromosomal mutations. But all organisms inherit DNA and the mutations from their parents. And these mistakes uh, are supposedly the engines that turn fish into philosophers from an evolutionary standpoint. Now, there are many different types of DNA, and, and our, I'm sorry, mutations in our DNA, and think of these as the individual strands of the DNA molecule. So this is one strand, and then during cell replication, it copies itself. Sometimes there is an extra nucleotide that gets inserted in there. Obviously, that's an insertion mutation. Sometimes one is deleted. Sometimes you get a string of these nucleotides that just flip end for end. And sometimes you get what's called a base substitution where you have a, a number of these nucleotides that are substituted for different types. Again, those are fairly, fairly, you know, minimal, but it does happen. And there are others that we call duplication. And we're going to talk about the duplication mutation a little bit more, but essentially it's when the nucleotides just duplicate themselves, they make exact copies of themselves and then insert them next to the existing ones. And there are point mutations, translocation mutations, and frame shift mutations as well. So many different types of mutations that scientists have uncovered. So let's set that aside for a second, and let's just define some additional terms that people use and they throw around all the time. Many people will call changes within a species, like the dog kind, the dog species, they'll call those microevolution. But it's neither evolution, nor is it anything related to do with mutations. It's the selection of specific traits that, that have existing information already included in the DNA. Dog breeders do this all the time. That's how we have so many different breeds of dogs. They've selectively bred out characteristics that they didn't want in the new breed and tried to accentuate those characteristics that they do want. 
So there's nothing, nothing about mutations here. It's just about a lot of information that's bred in the dogs, and they have all the different genetic variability that they have to get all these different animals. This is called the evolutionist tree of life. And supposedly, four billion years ago, natural processes produced the first living cell, amoeba or whatever you want to call it, and then slowly over time, from one common ancestor, that amoeba, through hundreds of millions of mutations, changes itself to different animal kinds all through the chain of life until you see everything that we have today, different branches of the tree. This is often called macroevolution. You'll hear that term. This requires that new information gets added to the gene pool. The amoeba doesn't have a lot of information. Pretty simple, even, even for an amoeba that's got pretty complex machinery. But you have to add new information into the gene pool to get all the other variety of life that we have. Supposedly, according to evolutionists, the only mechanism that can add information are mutations and then natural selection. We're going to see whether mutations actually add information or not, so stay tuned. We'll have more of that. So I would say we should be careful using the term microevolution. I, I wouldn't choose to use that at all because anybody that you talk to will ex extrapolate macroevolution from microevolution. And after all, uh, if one infers the other, you can have small changes in the species. Well, what, mean, what makes the difference? You can have large changes and have changes outside and even between animal kinds. So the preferred is not to use microevolution, but instead speciation or genetic variability, meaning that God created all the different animals, all the different plants, all the different fruits, everything that has DNA in it. He created it with genetic variability so that they could diversify with the genetic information that was already included in their genome, not through mutations. So natural selection is the ability then of some organisms to leave behind a, a higher number of offspring based on how well they're suited to a particular environment. That just means that, that some genes get better represented in the next population or the next generation and some of those other genes get weeded out and they become less common. But in the end, that's not evolution, that's the opposite. It's taking away information, not adding new information. It's just these genes are just being selected. The rest of the gene pool is being left behind. And natural selection then is the ability to adapt to your specific environment. That's survival of the fittest. Darwin had something right. It's, it's, we see this all the time in our world. Natural selection, by definition, though, can only act on the existing information that's stored in your genes. It can't create new information. We'll see that. Certain traits then are selected for, and they lead to a survival advantage. And, and here's a good example. We have many different varieties of bears, but they're all bears. Now, some of them are suited to different environments. We have some bears, uh, they like hot environments, and obviously we've got some that like cold environments. But they, they didn't choose what genes they were going to use and say, ah, I better go to the north or I better go to the south. They had the genes in the first place and that helped them to adapt to their specific environment. And then over time, they lost those genes and, and that's again a net loss of genetic information. So again, here's a quote from Parasitology, The Biology of Animal Parasites. Natural selection can only act on those biological properties that already exist. It cannot create new properties in order to meet adaptational needs. Let's just say, for example, that I don't see anybody that has red hair in here, but let's just say that red hair gave you better immunity to cancer. I don't have 
a gene or DNA one in my body for red hair. Does that mean that I can wish that my offspring would have a better survival advantage and so I can just wish them red hair? You can't wish genetic increase of information into nobody. If they don't have a gene for red hair, I don't. I can't pass that on to my offspring. If I married somebody that had red hair, that gene from my spouse could be inherited by our daughter. She doesn't have red hair, so my wife doesn't have a gene for red hair. <laughs> now, some ideas are that there is what's called fixity of species, and that's the animals that we see today are the same exact animals that God created at the very beginning. That's called fixity of species. Evolutionists will accuse, falsely, creationists of believing fixity of species. We do not. Creationists believe that God created the original cat kind, the original bird kind, the original turtle kind, or kind, and he placed in them all the different genetic variability that they would need to produce all of the other cats that we see, all of the other birds that we see, and all of the other turtles that we see. That's the biblical model. The evolutionary theory, theory says that as, as an organism is forming, it experiences some random change in, in their DNA, either by solar uh, exposure, radiation exposure, um, maybe chemical reactions, or just randomly. And then that randomly changed DNA, called a mutation, gets passed to another offspring if, according to evolutionary theory, if it provides new function. If it doesn't provide new function, by the definition of evolution, it's not passed on to the offspring because it has no use for it. And so that the parent would die, it wouldn't pass that gene on, and but that is, according to evolutionary theory, what terms man and molecules, or, or, or molecules in man, or mathematicians, I guess. Now, mutations can be classified into two major categories. The first category is those that either cause a gain or a loss in genetic information. The next category is those that cause either a gain or loss in biological function. Now the key to evolution, you must have both an increase in genetic information as well as an increase in biological function. If you don't, you can't have evolution. And we're going to look at all the variable or all the various possibilities that come up here. And the first one that we're going to look at is what's called detrimental mutations. This is by far the most common uh, form of mutation in all the DNA. They result in both a loss of genetic information, a, a deletion mutation, if you will, and a loss of biological function. And most end in disease or death. Diabetes, cancers, muscle dystrophy, all of those are examples of deletion or, or detrimental mutations. And this has been demonstrated in the lab with the common fruit fly. At the, the turn of the century, geneticists started breeding fruit flies and exposing them to massive amounts of radiation in hopes of inducing mutations so they could study them. They began this at the turn of the century in, in about 1910 is when they discovered the first mutation. Since 1910, there have only been about 3,000 mutations that have been identified. If you think about that, that's not a lot as fast as, as flies breed. So even detrimental mutations are fairly rare, but they are by far the most common. And we see that it provides a, a loss of information. Uh, you see the eyes have changed. Sometimes the wings are barely even formed at all, so the, the information for wings has been deleted, or at least healthy wings. Do you think any one of these is a, a, little, a better fly than the original? There's no increase in biological function. 
Uh, none of these, surprisingly, during all 3,000 of these mutations, have ever resulted in a different insect or a better fruit fly. And that ought to tell you something. Now, in theory, some mutations can cause a loss of genetic information, but can be an increase in biological function. Uh, the, the term beneficial mutations are used here, and, and they're rare, but you can point to some examples of that. And I will say that there truly, there are no really true beneficial mutations. They're just mutations that have a beneficial outcome. And the benefit generally negates itself if the environment changes. So it could be beneficial in a very specific environment, but then when that environment changes, it's no longer beneficial. And we're gonna look at this a good example is this eyeless fish in cave rivers. The fish, as you see, have scars where the eyeballs used to be located. Uh, but these eyes didn't degenerate because they didn't need them. There was a genetic mutation that caused the loss of the eyeball, a loss of information because they don't have any eyes. Now, in a normal environment, that'd be problematic, wouldn't it? They couldn't see their predator approaching them. But in a dark cave, does anybody care? In fact, a fish that has eyes may be at a disadvantage in a dark cave if they're swimming and there's a, a rock or a twig or something that scratches their eye. They can develop an infection and they can die. Uh, so fish who are blind may have a little bit better survival ability than a fish that has eyes. But again, what happens if you change the environment and bring that fish back out to a, a, a river that's not in the cave? It's not gonna last very long. Natural selection is gonna take its, its natural course right there. What about sickle cell anemia? Is that a beneficial mutation? I see hands, at first glance, you would say, well, heck, no, that's not a beneficial mutation. Those people who have one gene, that's, that's the mutated sickle cell, and one normal gene, the, the parasite for malaria can't survive in the red blood cell. And so people who have one good gene and one bad gene can't get malaria. Now, somebody who has two to mutated genes, they develop this disease called sickle, sickle cell anemia, which basically is a, a deformation of the red blood cells in your hemoglobin, so it doesn't carry oxygen efficiently. And it, it results in a very painful disease and a shortened lifespan. So you could say that somebody who has one of each gene has inefficient blood flow, or, or a, a blood with, with oxygen, but there was this similarity. This is still a loss of genetic information though, isn't it? What about bacteria that supposedly becomes immune to antibiotics? Evolutionists would say, oh, that's, that's evolution right before your very eyes. But is it? Let's look at the case of H. pylori bacteria. An antibiotic on any bacteria generally operates in, in a couple of different ways. It could attack um, some, some ability to absorb a certain nutrient, so the, the bacteria dies, or it could, in, like in the case of the uh, H. pylori, if it is absorbed through the skin or through the cell wall and it interacts with the enzyme that the bacteria has, it creates a deadly poison, and then the bacteria dies. That's the way it normally works. But there are mutated strains of H. pylori bacteria that don't have the enzyme. Is that a gain or a loss of information, by the way? That's a net loss in information. They don't have the ability to form the enzyme. So the, the antibiotic absorbed through the cell wall, there's nothing to react to, no enzyme, no poison, no death, that strain survives. 
And then, after the, this first bacteria who had the enzyme is gone, you have the mutant strain that survives and can produce offspring. That's survivability, adaptability, because of a mutation. A beneficial mutation, but a loss of information nonetheless. And there are other cases where some antibiotic resistance was already present in a bacterial population. And this, this is, actually has been discovered. Uh, bacteria has been harvested out of the frozen remains of people that have died. The, the most noteworthy one here is an 1845 Franklin expedition. Has anybody heard of that? In 1845, there was a, a couple of ships that decided they would try to find the Northwest Passage in northern Canada. They got lost. They froze to death. Uh, they were missing for, for a long time. Finally, their bodies were recovered. The DNA strands were resurrected from those people. And some scientists at the University of Alberta then studied these. And here's a quote from their paper. Not only are the six strains of bacteria almost certainly the oldest ever revived, says medical bio microbiologist Dr. Kenya, three of them also happen to be resistant to antibiotics which developed more than a century after the men died. So resistance to antibiotics is, is, that's, is that evidence for evolution? I would say that, that that ability was in their gene pool before they died. And they already had this resistance. So that's not evolution in action. That was already information that was in their genes. Now, theoretically, this gets to our third possibility here. Theoretically, and I say theoretically because it's just one of the possible combinations of these, you could have an increase in information and a decrease in function, or at least no change, which is called a neutral mutation. But that change would be either beneficial nor detrimental. And according to evolutionary theory, even neutral mutations wouldn't be passed on to the offspring. Now, I would say that there are no examples, and we'll look at this again, there are no examples where a mutation has ever increased information. But let's just say hypothetically, and this is the, this is the example that the evolutionists provide for this, uh, but this is called a neutral mutation. And this, remember we talked about gene duplication? This is the new rescuing device for evolutionists, to, to have new genes that can carry this novel information, but it's when, in this case, this is a chromosome duplication, and the gene is just duplicated in the copying process. Is that new information? It's copied information. It's the exact information that was coded in the original gene. Now there's just two copies of it. However, evolutionists will say that the duplicated gene now has all the freedom to explore and experiment with, not, with, with mutations so that it can come up with new novel uh, genes or new novel biological functions. This has to obviously be the answer to evolution then, right? Duplicate the gene, the organism can experiment with one of the genes. If it's a detrimental one, ah, no harm, no foul. We've got one more that we can rely on. It didn't kill the organism, so we're still in good shape. What's the evidence for that? Again, I would say the DNA or the gene doesn't provide new information, just a copy of the existing information. But here's their example. It's an Antarctic toothfish. Uh, this is an apparent mutation, what they say, in a family of fish in the Antarctic. Uh, and they've developed this unique ability to adapt to their environment by being able to produce their own antifreeze. It's called glycoprotein, which binds them to ice crystals in their blood, and it keeps it from growing. It keeps the ice crystals from, from growing bigger. So supposedly, in evolutionary terminology, 5 to 14 million years ago, when the oceans were a lot warmer, uh, these fish developed this 
this duplicated gene and they experimented with it and, and they believe that it developed a mutation in that gene uh, from some digestant agent and then it created this, this antifreeze instead. They say they didn't initially need it to survive, but then as the waters became colder, they were able to adapt to that colder environment. First, that's kind of suspect, right? Nobody was around supposedly 5 to 14 billion years ago to see what the initial genetic makeup was of this toothfish. It's more probable that it had all the all the genetic information that it needed at the time, God created it with all the information to adapt to a colder changing environment. We see this in a lot of different animal species. Secondly, there's no proof that it didn't have that ability to, to make that antifreeze even from the very beginning. Thirdly, if there was no immediate benefit, what happens during for the based on the evolutionary theory. It doesn't get passed on. So a very suspect example of whether this is actually new information or just duplicated information or information that was there from the very beginning. Now here's a quote from the Science Daily about this ice fish. This was in 2011. It says, researchers report that they are the first to show in molecular detail how one gene evolved into two competing functions that eventually split up via, via gene duplication to pursue their separate destinies. So, again, not an increase in information, duplication of information, but if the fish initially had two genes, they had, it had dual functions, right? Two different biological functions. It could survive in either case, cold water or warm water. Then, during cell duplication or, or uh, cell replication, it lost one of those biological functions. Again, is that increase or decrease in information? It's a net loss, or or at least neutral, for information or biological function. <coughs> now, other scientists would take a different approach and a different viewpoint. Here's a quote. Gene duplication doesn't necessarily constitute a lasting change in a species' genome. In fact, such changes often don't last past the initial host organism. Duplications can be and often are marginally or severely detrimental. For instance, duplications are a common cause of many types of cancer. Is gene duplication the, the mutation for, that's the mechanism for evolution? No. So, when we look at this, are there any real examples that are an increase of genetic information and a decrease or no change in biological function? Well, certainly, again, no increase in information, questionable whether it had a benefit for biological function increase or not, or whether it lost that dual function. So, what about the last category that we have? These are the upward and onward mutations that we talked about for evolution to be real and, and possible. These are an increase of genetic information as well as an increase in biological function. They must come together for new information and new structures to be added into the gene pool. And if you think about it, doesn't there have to be multiple millions of these throughout billions of years of history to get all the different animals that we have today. But yet, no one can seem to put their finger on one such mutation that provides an increase in information and an increase in biological function. Not one. Here's a quote from Lee Spetner. He's a PhD in physics at MIT. He wrote a book that was entitled Not By Chance. And he says, all point mutations that have been studied on the molecular level turn out to reduce the genetic information and not to increase it. Not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. That's a pretty, pretty big statement against evolutionary claims. <clears throat> 
Here's another statement from David Gartner, a prominent writer at Yale University. He's a professor there. In a recent essay, he said, there's no reason to doubt that Darwin successfully explained the small adjustments by which an organism adapts to local circumstances. What's that? Natural selection, right? We can explain that. Changes to fur density or wing style or beak shape. Yet there are many reasons to doubt whether he can explain the big picture. Not the fine tuning of species, but the emergence of new ones. Now over the years, there have been all of these claims from evolutionists that these are, are real evolution right before our very eyes. How many have heard about England's peppered moths? We have one in the crowd. She's my daughter. She knows. She's her niece. There's a couple of them out there. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about this briefly. Darwin's finches. Yeah, read really Darwin's finches. How about Archaeopteryx, the supposed transition from dinosaurs to birds? Yeah, there's some of them out here too. So let's look at England's peppered moths first. These, these come in predominantly two colors, dark and light. And during the Industrial Revolution, when there was a lot of, of coal burning, a lot of pollution, the trunks of the trees got darker. And people started noticing there's a predominance of the dark colored moths because the light colored moths provide too much of a contrast to the dark bark and they were eaten by birds. And then as the pollution cleared up, then we see this nice camouflaged one here, a light colored moth, and then the dark ones were more easy to get picked off by birds. Well, Darwin looked at this and he said, there you go, there's evolution right there before your very eyes. But I would say again, this is not due to mutations, it's due to the information that was already there in the first place. It just provided a different survival advantage at the time. So it was later discovered that peppered moths don't even rest on the trunks of trees. They live on the underside of the leaves up in the tree canopy, and the scientists just glued the moths, dead moths, onto the trunk of the tree and staged the pictures. <laughs> That has come out. That is a true fact. There were already light and dark moths in the population, so there's not mutations that are occurring here. This is genetic diversity based on their ability to adapt to their environment. And so that shifting colors is just a response to, to the natural ability that they have to change colors. Now, here's some interesting science that has been studied since then. This will blow you away. But first of all, yeah, we'll, we'll call Darwin a fraud here on the peppered moths. But look about this. Here's the truth about the peppered moth is that God designed a very unique ability uh, in these, this larva of the peppered moth to camouflage to avoid being eaten by birds. They can actually change their skin color in just a few weeks based on the color of branch that they happen to be on. They can actually detect the color of the branch through their skin. Now scientists, to prove this, took half of the moths in their laboratory and they painted their eyes black so they couldn't see. And then they put them in this experiment with all these different colored rods. First of all, they placed the, the larva on a rod that was different from the color that they were, and within a few weeks, they had turned their skin color to the color of the rod they were on. They did another experiment where they, still half of them had, had no sight and the other ones could see. They, they took them off the rods, and the rods that they climbed onto <coughs> were the rods that more closely mimic their existing skin color. Clearly, this is not attributed to mutations. 
but it's the, the ability that they were programmed with a whole suite of instructions that God gave them in the beginning to detect changes in their environment and to adapt to it. We see other animals that have that ability as well, right? What are those little lizards called? Chameleons. So we've seen that. So imagine these caterpillars, these, these larvae from these, these moths can change colors like this. Well, does it surprise you that they've been able to change their color on the supposed trunks of these trees when they were adults, when they were adult moths? That is just a complex mechanism that God designed into their genes from the very beginning. So what about Darwin's finches? Darwin was on the, the Galapagos Islands and he noticed groups of finches on four, four of the islands that had very similar features to finches that he had seen in England 600 miles away. He said they were, they were some, supposedly from the same ancestral family as these finches that he found in the Galapagos. But he noted that some of them had longer, more delicate beaks, and then some had these, these fatter, stouter beaks. And what he noted that during certain times of the year, based on the rainfall, there were different seed types. And so the finches kind of matched whatever the seed type was at the time. In, in times where there were lots of rainfall, what you saw was more birds with slender, longer beaks because they could get into the tight places to pick out the abundance of smaller seeds. Then in periods of drought, when the, all the, the small seeds were picked over, there was a, a preponderance of birds that had these longer, stronger beaks that could actually eat bigger seeds or break the, the seeds from, from the, the seed pods. And so again, Darwin said, oh, there's evolution right there before our very eyes. But again, this is adaptation, not evolution. No new genes were produced. It has nothing to do about new genes and new information. It just, again, choosing from the existing genetic information that these finches already had. It was later discovered, too, that Darwin misclassified many of these birds as a new species, when in, a, in a fact, they were just variations of the finch. And so this also demonstrates how quickly variation can occur in a species. So again, Darwin was wrong. Finally, we're going to look at this uh, supposed transitionary fossil called Archaeopteryx. Um, it's supposed to be the transition from dinosaurs to birds. And they say that because you have this, this S-shaped neck, the, the finger claws there that, that are on the bones here at the end of the wings. You've got this long, straight, bony tail. And finally, you have these uh, feathers that supposedly are, are looking like scales. So we're going to look at this because if you compare birds and dinosaurs, there are huge genetic differences that, that supposed evolution has to overcome. And it's impossible to do this through a transitional species. It has to happen rapidly if it's going to happen at all. And here's just some of the reasons why it can't be a transition. First of all, birds are warm-blooded. That means they're like us. They have a constant body temperature. And no matter what the temperature is outside, their temperature remains the same. Reptiles, on the other hand, are cold-blooded. And their body temperature adjusts to whatever the climate is outside. So huge change that has to be overcome, stepwise fashion for through some transitionary species. <coughs> what about the lung style? The avian lung, or the lung in a bird, and the reptilian lung that we see in dinosaurs and, and reptiles today. Birds have a unique lung design. It's basically a unidirectional flow of oxygen through tubes that pass through the lung. 
It has to be very efficient for the exchange of oxygen. So the oxygen flows one direction, the blood flows a different direction. It's picking up oxygen constantly. And it makes sense for birds because they're in flight, they're expending a lot of energy, so they have to have a great amount of oxygen transfer into their blood. Reptiles are similar to us with a lung type that's more like a bellows. We breathe oxygen in, reptiles breathe oxygen in. There's a transfer between carbon dioxide off of the blood, oxygen into the blood. And so for a time, there are both carbon dioxide and oxygen in our lungs. It's not very efficient for birds, but it's okay for us. So the stale air then is breathed out in the same manner in which it's breathed in. So two totally different lung designs, how can that change be made slowly over time? Yeah, I'm either breathing one direction or I'm breathing two directions. I'm either picking up oxygen opposite the direction that the air is flowing with my blood or I'm not. Thirdly, what about the, the three-fingered hand development that's, uh, that's different between developing birds and developing reptiles. Here's a, uh, a x-ray, and finger development is based on a five-fingered hand, with the thumb being digit number one in this picture down here in this lower left-hand corner. Fingers normally start, all five fingers begin to develop, and then it stops in some of these appendages. And some either stop completely or it's, it's greatly reduced in size and function. Now, it's interesting because birds will start forming all five digits, but then they only retain fingers two, three, and four in this sketch. Dinosaurs or reptiles retain fingers one, two, and three. Now you would think if dinosaurs turned into birds that they would at least retain the same digits, but they don't. And finally, the difference between birds and dinosaurs is feathers versus scales. Now, feathers grow and are shed individually. You've all picked up a, a feather that's laying on the ground. Scales are formed and are shed in sheets. Major difference between those two. Feathers are also very complex structures compared to just one sheet of a scale. Feathers have hundreds of barbs and barbules that overlap and, and hold the feather together. If it didn't, as it's flying, all these fibers would just separate and the bird would have no ability to fly. And it, they all have hundreds and hundreds of, of little hinged hooklets that hook one feather to the other to make it very stable when it flies. So clearly, the information required to code, yeah, the information required to code for feathers is far different than the information required for the construction of, of scales. Now, if scales evolved into feathers, a significant amount of information would have to be added into the bird's DNA to arise for the possibility for flight. The question is, well, how did that genetic information, how did it arise? Did dinosaurs just see an advantage somewhere in, in, in a dream that they had? Boy, I would be much more fit, could survive much better if I could just fly. Oh, I think I better grow feathers. That's what happens, yes. No, we've already seen that there are no examples of mutations that can create even just a little information in the gene pool. You can't have small incremental changes to change from one totally different creature to another totally different creature. I don't care how many transitions it goes through, it's all or none, right? Uh, so, so we've already seen that uh, this does not create new information or biological function just by hoping. 
Now, DNA can't be passed on by wishful thinking because it's only going to end in disaster, right? As I said, this doesn't get you new information. This gets you a pretty disastrous result. If you are a transitionary feed of, of fossil or a transitionary animal that didn't quite develop the skills to, to grow feathers, but you thought, hey, I'm going to give it a shot anyway, you're not even going to pass that DNA, that mutated gene, on your offspring. So mutations cause a loss of information, and natural selection, again, only acts on those traits that are already present. Now, every structure or organ must be represented by information at the genetic level in a written code on our DNA. DNA for feathers is simply not present in reptiles. It is not there, so it cannot be selected for. Now, it's also interesting that true bird fossils have been found in rock layers in the same layers as the Archaeopteryx, a supposed transitionary fossil, in the same rock layers as their ancestors, dinosaur ancestors have supposedly come from. Uh, here's a question. If dinosaurs actually did evolve into birds or into archaeopteryx, you would expect to see fossils of dinosaurs, of, of what's called the theropod dinosaurs. Theropod dinosaurs are, are what's called bird hit. Not all dinosaurs supposedly evolved into birds, just the theropods, like T. rex, that have bird hips that kind of walks like the bird. But what we see is fossils of T. rex much, much higher in the fossil layers than the Archaeopteryx. How does that happen if the Archaeopteryx is a transitional fossil? Pretty impossible. There's even more problems for this uh, dinosaur to bird evolution. This is a picture out of the May 2018 National Geographic magazine. Uh, this includes the latest find of Vagabus, a bird that looks like a modern duck. Brad's a duck hunter. That's the kind of duck he'd go after, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it was actually discovered to be contemporary with dinosaurs, again, completely debunking the theory that dinosaurs evolved into birds. And here's a, a fossil that you're going to ask me, well, what does this have to do with it? Well, stay tuned, I'll tell you. This is a fossil of a, a primitive crow-sized bird from supposedly the, the early Cretaceous period that was found in sediment layers in China, hence the name Confucius Sordis, conf named after Confucius. It supposedly dates back 125 to 120 million years ago, according to evolutionary time scales. Like modern birds, it has a toothless beak, and obviously it has feathers, very clear feathers here in the fossil. It is the oldest known bird to have a beak, according to evolutionists. Let's go to a different fossil. This is actually an artist's rendition of a dinosaur called Sinocalyopteryx. It was also discovered in China, and uh, it's a dinosaur that was known to eat birds. And you can see the arch rendition with a bird in its mouth. If you're thinking, that sounds like a problem for dinosaur to bird evolution, you're probably right. How do you know that it ate birds first? Well, this is the actual fossil that they found. And you can see here in the blow up, there are actually three burrs that were discovered in the stomach of this dinosaur. The ones that actually studied this fossil wrote a paper, and here's their quote. Based on the analysis, the avian remains, the bird remains, in the Sinocalyopteryx are unequivocally assignable to Confucius Sornus, the bird. That causes a problem it's, it's hard to stomach for evolutionists. But here's a quote from John Rubin, Oregon State Professor of Zoology. 
Uh, and he angrily summed up the problem that, that this poses, among other things. He said, for one thing, birds are found earlier in the fossil record than the dinosaurs that they are supposed to have descended from. That's a pretty serious problem. And there are other inconsistencies with the bird from dinosaur theories. And obviously one of these is, well, certainly the dinosaurs were already eating the birds that they were supposed to have evolved into. That's a, a pretty significant problem. Maybe that's how they got the DNA. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, they consumed the DNA and then they were able to fly. Yes. Now you're thinking outside the box. You're <laughs> so this, this whole idea of archaeology as being this transitional fossil between birds and, or dinosaurs and birds is just simply not true. Now, Dr. Colin Patterson, former senior paleontologist at the British Museum of Natural History, he wrote a book called Evolution. In this book, he talked about a lot of transitional fossils. And in a reply from somebody who questioned him as to, well, if there's so many transitional fossils, why didn't you show any pictures of them in your book? And he said, I fully agree with your comments about the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any, fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line, there is not one such fossil of which one can make a watertight argument. That pretty much says it from the horse's mouth, right? So what do you get when you breed two dogs? A dog. You don't get cats? Then you get a horse. You get a horse, yeah. No, you get more dogs. <laughs> Not only that, you get lots and lots of dogs. And the original dog kind, let's say it was the wolf or some other kind of dog kind, God created all the initial genetic variability that that dog needed to get all the different varieties of dogs that we have today. Can I breed two golden retrievers and get anything but a golden retriever? No. I can't breed golden retrievers and get collies or, or poodles or anything like that. You first, to be able to get back to any variety like the wolf, you have to add genetic information back into the gene pool. So you would have to crossbreed dingoes and collies or golden retrievers and collies. We would call that one. A mutt. But the mutt has more genetic information than a purebred dog. So if we want to get back to the original dog kind, we have to recombine the genes into the gene pool. And so this demonstrates an actual loss in genetic information. Obviously not by mutation, but just selective breeding. So as impossible as it is to believe in evolution, secular scientists will still grasp on to every hope that they have. Here's a quote from George Wald, Harvard University. He actually won the Nobel Peace Prize, and he had this quote. One has to only contemplate the magnitude of this task to conceive that spontaneous generation of a living organism is, is impossible. Spontaneous generation, as you remember, is life or non-life, just spontaneously. Yet, we are here as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. He goes on to say, when it comes to the origin of life, we have only two possibilities of how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation was scientifically disproved 100 years ago by Louis Pasteur, Bonazzi, Reddy, and others. That leads us scientifically to only one possible conclusion, that life arose as a supernatural creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible, spontaneous generation arising to evolution. Perfect. Folks, that's what it's all about. 
if you reject a creator God, you only have one solution, and that's to believe something that you know philosophically and intellectually is not true. But the hope is there because if you just have enough time, time is our friend, it may just happen. What's well, never happened, never will happen. So, if mutations cause no increase in genetic information or function, it can't be passed on to their offspring. Mutations we found do not add any new information to the genome, and mutations can only alter existing genetic information. I see that's the engine of evolution going in the wrong direction, right? If that is the supposed driving force in evolution, they have no leg to stand on. Now remember the, the evolutionary tree of life from one common ancestor? And I'm wrapping up here. This is the Bible's demonstration of what's called the orchard of life. 6,000 years ago, God created every animal kind, every plant kind, every insect kind, every bird kind by his spoken word. And then God placed great genetic variability into each one of these animal kinds who produced a great amount of diversity within that animal kind. Then what happened? Noah's flood came killed everything that lived on the earth, except for two of every representative animal kind that was taken onto the ark. That kind still had enough genetic variability to give us all of these different diversity of animals that we have in the animal kinds. Obviously, some died out, Dinosaurs being one of those, there are animals that have gone extinct. Obviously, this is the biblical picture that we get from God's word is the true way that we see life surviving today with all the different variability again to give us even more creatures that we have, even, even more breeds of dogs. A total of 10 times in Genesis 1, God says, I created things according to its kind or its kind. How much more plain can it be? So here's the final exam question then for tonight to see if you've all been good students. Are good mutations that result in new life possible? Not this change, right? But yes, there are beneficial changes. That's a, a non-Christian to a Christian. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things are, have come. That's the beneficial mutation right there, right? The beneficial change of life. So in summary, God provided a complex system of DNA that contains all the information needed for life and function. God is the source of that information. Information doesn't arise spontaneously from anything else. And only a Christian worldview in observational science can make meaning of life, not billions of mutations that don't do anything to the genome. There you go. Evolution, right before <laughs>